Hi, and welcome to the Website from Scratch course. My name is Lawrence. I'm going to be your instructor for this course. I come to you with many years of web development experience. I'm ready to share my knowledge with you in creating a website from scratch. We're going to be using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript in order to create a fully responsive modern website from scratch, setting up the HTML structure, and then applying CSS styling in order to customize the look and feel of the website. All of the source code is included, and I do encourage you as you go through the lessons of the course to try out the code for yourself in order to build your own version of the website. The upcoming lessons are gonna be perfect for those of you that have HTML and CSS experience and are looking to apply that experience in creating a website. The website that is gonna be created is gonna be using floats in order to float the navigation bar and also using media queries for responsive design. So that means that on smaller screens, it can look different than it does on the larger screens. We can apply different styling properties depending on the screen size. It's also gonna be a quick overview of the, some of the commonly used, used HTML elements and how to apply them, set them up in order to create your website from scratch. The upcoming lessons are gonna be presented in a step-by-step -step format we're showing you what's going to be covered in the lesson, and then we're going to jump right into the coding, go through walking you through step by step how to accomplish the goal of the lesson. If you have any questions or comments, I'm always happy to hear from you. Let's get coding and create this website. It's going to be a setup lesson and how to create an HTML file. So this is going to be a basic HTML file where we're creating and using the four tags that are needed, such as the HTML tag, the head tag, the title tag, and the body tag and then also the editor that we're using, the browser that we're using, and how to prepare for the upcoming lessons, how to get your HTML file within the browser, either by its file location or using a local machine that you can render out the file and see the results. So that's all coming up in this lesson. First thing that we're gonna need in order to write code is an editor. And then the second thing, of course, is that we need a browser to run the code within. So the editor that I am going to be using for this course is going to be Visual Studio Code. So this is available as a free open source editor. So if you are looking for an editor or you want to use the same one that I'm using, that's available at code.visualstudio.com. The tool that you're going to need is a browser, and you probably already have a browser on your computer. So this is the one that I'm going to be using. It's going to be the Chrome browser. I'm going to open up the editor and create a file called index.html. So this will be our main starting file that we're gonna be writing the code into. And I'm gonna have the editor opened on the left-hand side with the new file, the HTML file. And on the right-hand side, I'll have the browser window with the file running so that we can see the content being updated as I'm writing the code. So there's a several different ways when you have the code editor in order to open up the file within the browser and because this is going to be straight HTML and CSS you can simply drag it and drop it over. The browser is going to be looking for the file to the path of where the file is going to be located on your computer so once you have that you can simply load to that file page and open it up within the editor. The other resource that I am going to be using is going to be a add-on within the Visual Studio Code. So this is available for those of you that are using Visual Studio Code. And it's not mandatory because it's not needed because this is just regular front-end code. But if you do want to run a live server, which I am going to be doing, which is going to show the updates exactly when I do make updates to the page content, this is an extension that's available within Visual Studio Code. It's called Live Server. So in order to install it, you can type in live server within the extensions. You can open up the extensions under the preferences and select extensions or use the shortcut on your computer in order to set and select the extensions. So once you have live server found, this is where live server is. It's created by Ritwick Day and there's quite a lot of downloads of it. So it's extremely popular and it allows you to launch a development local server with live server and runs that live file directly within your local machine. Do have it installed 
and I'm going to close off the extensions. So you will need to have an index file, a workspace with the index file. And this is going to be the default file that's going to be opened whenever I run the code within the live server. So first up, we are going to need to set up our HTML file. So we're going to start by setting up the doc type. So the doc type indicates to the browser when it encounters the HTML file, what type of file it can expect. So doc type HTML indicates that this is an HTML5 file. And then the next tag that we're going to need is going to be an HTML tag. So opening and closing of the HTML tag and all of the content will go in between the opened and closed HTML tags. The next one that we're going to be using is going to be a head tag. So this is where the content goes that we want the browser to be able to see. And this isn't going to be for the viewer of the web page, but this is going to be where the information goes. So meta information, title, linking to style sheets and so on. So content that is not seen by the user and used by the browser in order to better render out the page and also linking out to style sheets and so on. So go ahead within the HTML tags, add in a head tag. And then there's also the body tag. So these are going to be the, there's, gonna, there's four mandatory tags that you should have within every HTML file. So that's the HTML, the head, the body, and the last one that you need is the title tag. Opening and closing of the title tag. The title tag is actually what's going to indicate within the open tabs what the title of the page is. So this is necessary. It's also really important for SEO. I'm going to call it website HTML CSS. When you are creating a title and you're launching your website, you're going to have a real, you're going to want to have a more meaningful name. But in this case, because this is just a demo of creating the website, I'm giving it a simple title name. So these are the four mandatory tags that you should have within every HTML file in order for it to run properly within the browser. So once you've created the HTML file within a folder, saved it, now we're ready to launch it within the web page, setting it up and looking for it locally. So this is the path where I've got the HTML file located locally. If I refresh it, we're going to see that what happened is within the tab, the tab title changed here. If we add in some content and let's go ahead and we're just going to type the text hello world into the body area and refresh it again. So now we've got the hello world written within the HTML file and that's being rendered out within the browser. So the rest of the content here, we're not going to see the effects of those tags, but this helps the browser in order to properly render out that and the content that we're wanting to display within the page. And for those of you that do have the live server set up, once you've created the HTML file, you can open live server or do it with a shortcut. That will do is that's going to open up the file within the live server. And we notice that we get an error here that the folder or it's not part of a workspace. So within Visual Studio Code, in order to run the live server, we have to save this as a workspace. So we have to add the folder to the workspace or we have to save as a workspace and select the folder that we want to use. So I've simply selected the folder, set it up as a workspace. And then once we have the folder, let's add the folder to the workspace, selecting add within the folder directory. And let's try that one more time where we open the live server within the browser. And now we've got a live rendering of the page. Notice that the address within the address bar has changed. So this is a local address running on my machine. And this isn't going to be web accessible. It's running only on my machine and it's for development purposes. So if I make any changes to the code, I save it, it's going to immediately show within the web page. I'll also make this bigger and then we'll size it down after once we start developing and adding some code. So go ahead and get set up, create your HTML file and have your editor open that you can update the file and then have the file running within the browser so that when you do make updates to your HTML file, you can refresh either using the file path or using a local machine and see the results within the browser. And you'll be ready to move on to the next lesson. So let's say we're going to be covering some basic structure and some styling properties and how to add styling properties to your HTML elements. So creating three HTML elements. These are all going to be block elements with the header, div, and footer. And so these are all structure elements that we can then use CSS, select those elements, apply properties to them. In this case, we're going to be applying a background color as well as a color, looking at the named color values, the hex color values, and also RGB for colors. 
Creating an index.html file will serve as the entry point for your website. So this is where all of the files are going to start out with. And when anyone comes to your website, this is the main starting point for when they're going to be browsing through your web content. Also, the HTML file can be used in order to link to different style sheets. And within the style sheets, this is where we can apply styling to the web page elements. So go ahead and create the HTML file if you haven't already. And we're going to also create a file called style.css. So this is going to be using the CSS extension. There's two ways to bring styling into your web page. And one of them is to add the style tags directly within the HTML file. So using the style tags, which again is just typical as HTML structure, where you have an opening and closing tag. And then within the between the tags, this is where the structure is going to go. And with styling, you need to select the page element that you want to apply styling to. So there's a number of ways to do that. One of them is selecting it by the tag name. And I'll be showing you the other ways as well as we go through the lessons of this course. So I'm going to select the body tag because that's the only element that I have within the page that's visible. Selecting the body tag and then using the curly brackets, we can add in the different styling that we want to attach to the body tag. So the styling that we want to attach to the body is going to be a background color. And then the editor is actually doing the drop down where it's providing the options for colors. I'm going to just write the color of red. So within the CSS, we also have named colors. We can use hex colors. We can use RGB colors. So I'll take a look at those later on in the upcoming lessons as well. So right now we, we're doing with this line command is when the HTML file gets rendered out, it's going to render out the title, then it's going to hit the style tag. Within the style tags, it knows that this is going to be applying styling to the page elements, selecting the element that the styling is going to be applied to, and that's going to be providing a background color of red. One of the disadvantages of adding style directly within the HTML file is that if you are linking the same style sheet to multiple web pages, you need to go into every single one and make an update. So if I add index one, index two, index three, index four, and I want it to update all of the background colors. So if I didn't like red anymore, I want to update it to blue. I would have to go into every single one of those files and make the update. Whereas if we're linking to a style sheet, using the CSS file type, that gives us the ability to update it only within the one place. So for this lesson and best practices is to link to a style sheet. So what we're going to do is we're going to add that link and that's using a link tag. And the link tag is slightly different than what we've seen with the other HTML tags as it doesn't have a closing tag. It's got self closing. And the information from the link tag is that's contained within the link tag is going to be within the attributes of the link tag. So setting up the attributes, we're using the REL attribute. And this is where we're going to indicate what type of link it's going to be expecting and expecting a style sheet. So once again, giving the browser additional information when it's rendering out the content and notice as well that this is also contained within the head section of the tags as this isn't going to be visible content that we're going to see within the web page. So proper structure is to keep the links to the style sheet and also adjustments to the style sheet using the style tags within the head section of your HTML page. And the next part of this is to create a link to the actual style sheet and you can use the href tag and select an equal sign. And then from here is where we're going to set the path to where the file is going to be located. I'm going to be saving the file within the same directory as I have my index file. So I'm calling it style.css. And then we can go ahead and we can close off the style tag. So let's save that. And we don't have a style.css file. So we're going to have to create one and then we can add in the body tag color and set the color of the body tag to a different color within the style sheet. So go ahead and create a new file, 
save it as style.css within the same directory. And I'm going to copy out and remove out the body tags. And we won't need the style tags anymore, so I'm going to be removing those as well. Notice as our page goes back to the default color, which is white. And within the style.css, this is where we're going to add the blue color back in. So instead of having the styling and the HTML within one file, now we've got an ability to separate it and we can link to the style sheet from other HTML files, which makes it more flexible when we're updating our web page content. So now that we've linked our HTML and our style CSS file, now we can apply some additional structure within the HTML and then select those tags in order to apply styling to those tags. And we're going to get rid of the hello world too, as when we're adding the structure of the page, we're going to add the content afterwards. So first of all, we want to set up the structure of the page and then set the content afterwards. And then we can use the styling in order to update how that content is being displayed within the web page. So within a typical web page, you're going to have different sections. So you can think of your web page within a table like structure. I'm going to get rid of the background color of blue. And so we're just going to go back to the default of white. So within the web page, we have a typical structure where most websites are going to have a header area. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to use the opening and closing of the header tags. And these tags themselves, they have some styling applied to the tags, and those can be updated within the style sheet. The next part of it is where we're going to put our content. So I'm going to use the div tags and opening and closing. And the interesting thing about headers and divs, they're going to get the same styling properties that are being attached to them. And what we're going to do is we're going to add background colors to them so that we can see them rendered out within the HTML page. And then the last part is we're going to add in a footer. So opening and closing of the footer tags. And then once we save that, Let's go into the style sheet and instead of selecting the body tag, we're going to select the header and set a background color for the header. And I'll set this as black for the div, set a background color and I'll set that as white. And for the footer, we're going to set a background color as red. So the process is always going to be the same when we are applying styling. We select the HTML tag or the HTML element that we want to apply styling to, and then we set the styling properties. And we're going to be introducing more styling properties as we go through the lessons of the course. So the background color is very basic one where we can set a color of the background of a particular element. And if the element that is contained within it doesn't have a background color, that background color will also be shown within those inner elements. So that will go as the default color for those inner elements. And you'll also notice that we don't actually see anything on the web page. So let's save that and we're going to go back into the HTML and we're going to add some content between the header. So we're going to write the word header. We'll write the word content within the div, and then we're going to write the word footer within the footer area. So what happened now is now that we do have content, we can actually see the content and the elements being rendered out within the web page on the right hand side. Within the browser, Chrome browser does come with the developer tools. So this is a set of tools that are built into every browser, and this can give you more information about the web page. And this also gets you interact with the HTML and CSS in order to see what properties are applied to each one of those elements. In order to open up the developer tools within Chrome, you can right click on the element and select inspect, or you can go up to the top right hand side. You've got the three dots there. And under the three dots, scroll down to more tools. Under the more tools, select developer tools. This is going to open up the developer tools window. And in this case, I do have the developer tools window docked to the bottom. By default, it's going to be docked to the right hand side. 
and you can also output it within a separate window so you can completely undock it from your HTML file. And this can be done where within the developer tools window, there's three dots and this gives you more options on how you want to set up and how you can interact with the document. So go over to the elements tab and select the elements. And within the elements tab, we can see the three elements of the page. If you open up the styles part, which is at the bottom of the elements tab, we can see the different elements and the styles that are being applied to those. We can also uncheck those and check those once again. Notice that the footer does have a display block property. This is added by default as this is going to be a block style element. And that goes for the uh, CSS of the div as well as for the header. So they're all going to be block elements. Style property that's being applied to this particular element. And this is how you can use the browser in order to inspect and find out more about the elements. So you can select the elements either from the elements tab within the viewing area where you can select the elements and then look at the styles. There's also a computed which gives you the box model which includes the height and width, the padding, the border and margin which we are going to be looking at later on in this lesson. There's also the layout, there's event listeners. So these are all different JavaScript events that might be added to your pages. And then the different properties of the elements so you can select all of that information and you can use that information when you're developing your web page. So I'm going to close this for now and we'll also go back to the style properties and notice that within the header we don't actually see the text because the font color is the same as the background color. So we can select and we can add in a specific font color for this element and in this case I'm going to set it up as white and instead of using the words, I use the hex value for white. So hex values are starting with the hash and then indicating the different colors that you want to use. And that would be ending with starting with 0000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000 which is black, and then applying shading to it. And hex ends at 16 characters. So that includes the A, B, C, D, E, and F within the numbers. So hex for white would be F, 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 F. We can include numbers as well. And this would be a gray shade. And we could also do combinations as these are going to be hex values. So that also gives us a gray shade. It's going to be at the max of the spectrum, which is going to be F, 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 F. There's also a way to do it with the RGB. So that's the red, green, blue spectrum. So that's starting at zero, zero, zero. And then you can increment those and zero, 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 much like when we had the hex value of zero, 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 that just produces a black color. So that returned back a black color. If we want to have a red value within the RGB, then we would use a value of 255. So it's returning back a value of zero to 255 and this is applying the different shading to those values. So if we were to take the hex value and update that and set the first value to the max, which was 255 in RGB and FF in hex, and we set the rest of the values to zero, this is gonna produce red. So these are gonna be the same colors and they're also just red because this is gonna be the max for the RGB. So those are the options that you can have for colors. There's also an RGBA, which allows you to have a fourth property value, and that can be an alpha value. So that's RGBA. So that provides an alpha value, which will show through any underneath content that is underneath the footer, so underneath the background color. Otherwise, they're producing solid background colors that we're not able to see the content through. There's also a short format for hex. You can use, if you're using a repeat of FFFF, you can also use the three FFs. If they're all going to be the same, then you can simplify the hex into three characters. And for RGBA, the alpha has a value of 0 to 1, 1 being solid. 
So that's the default, and that's also what we saw with the RGB, and the zero point decimal point values are gonna be how much alpha is applied. If we apply an alpha of zero, that's gonna completely remove the background from visibility. So go ahead and create some page structure with the header, the div, the footer, and then select them within the CSS and apply some styling to them, and you're gonna be ready to move on to the next lesson. So that's when we're gonna be setting up the basic structure, adding in some content for the web page, adding in the navigation, the header content, three different areas where we've got articles, so we can section off the different pieces of content within the web page, and then also within the footer, it's also gonna have three columns, and we're gonna be doing all of that, and once we apply styling to the page. We're also using some placeholder images and text as we're developing the website, and when we apply styling, having the placeholder text and images is gonna give it a more realistic feel as we're developing the site. So lesson, we're gonna be updating the HTML structure that we created in the previous lesson, and then adding a navigation bar in addition to adding some placeholder content so it looks like an actual real website. So let's go into the header area and add in a navigation bar within the head section of the page. And we're also gonna add in a spot for a heading as well as a spot for a page logo. And we're gonna do that adding in divs. So this div is gonna be where we've got our main heading content. And we can wrap this within the div. And then inside of that div, let's go ahead and we're gonna add in another div. And this is gonna be where we're gonna add in the logo. So give it a class of logo. So this way we can select the page logo within the HTML styling. And then within the header itself, add in another div. And the divs are gonna be used in order to create structure that's within the header element. So we've got a main div, and this is gonna be where our header content is gonna go, including a header and a logo. And then just below that, we're gonna add an unordered list and use the unordered list in order to set up a navigation. And we can also wrap this one in a nav tag so that our navigation for the website is going to be contained within the nav element with the opening and closing nav tags and the unordered list with the opening and closing unordered list tags. And then inside, adding in the different list items and within the lists, adding in the hyperlinks that are going to link out to the various web pages. So for now, I'm gonna just use the hash in order to indicate that this is gonna be a link, and then we can update the links as we wrap up the rest of the website. So within the unordered list and the list items, add in the different pages that you have for your website. So typically within a website, we've got the home page, we might have an about page, there also might be a contact page, and then something about the services or products that are being offered. So adding in all of those list items is gonna present the page like this. The heading as well is still sitting within the white background, and the header itself has all of the properties that we set within the styling. So I'm gonna go ahead and gonna remove out the color and also the background color of the header. So that way we can see the content and we can update that afterwards in the upcoming lesson as we wrap up the content. So that gives us our logo, our navigation header for the website, and then the navigation list of web pages that are contained within the website. Within the div area where we've got content, we're gonna divide this into different sections. And you can use, there's various tags that can be used. So you can use either the article or the section. So in this case, I am gonna use the article tag. So this is where our main content is gonna go for the web page. So this is where we can contain some main content. And we might use several different articles, subcontent, and then content. So that gives us spacing where we can add in that information. And then the last part is where we've got the footer. Outside of the footer, if you wanna have multiple Columns within the footer, you can do that. It'll set that to have columns within the footer where we have column one, two, and three. 
and then within each one of these we can contain different pieces of information. So right now without the styling it looks very plain. They're just one stacked upon the other and it's using the default styling from the page elements. And as soon as we apply the CSS styling, it's going to bring the page and allow us to move elements around, position content, update the colors, and really to customize the way that the content is being presented. So we're going to add in some additional content into the page. So within the content area, I'm going over to a Lorem Ipsum generator. It's a number of these types of websites that allow you to generate text and this can be used as placeholder text. So it's lorem ipsum text, and this particular website is lipsum.com, and allows you to generate a number of paragraphs of lorem ipsum text. So I just selected to generate, and I'm gonna copy some of this text so that our website has more of a feel that it's an actual website. There's real content contained within the website. And as we're developing it, it'll be closer to what we would be expecting for the finished product. So that gave us some content for the website. There's also placeholders for images. So the one that I like to use is placeholder.com. So this is a resource where you can select images, you can update the various image sizes and customize how the images get output. So using via.placeholder.com forward slash 150 generates a square dummy image that can be used. And there's also some ways to add in text and also customize the image output. So I'm gonna go ahead and select this value and add in an image within the article area and wrap this into an image tag using it as the source for the image. So that will add the image into the page. So with the placeholder images, this also allows you a way to customize the height and the width of the image, so different dimensions for the image. And this way you can really customize it and before you have the assets ready, so before you have the images ready, you can already have them and place them within your web page as you're designing it. So if you know you need an image that's going to be 350 wide and 220 high and it's going to be PNG, then you can add that in. And I'm going to just set this as a temp image and I'm actually going to set it as my name and we can save that and now we've got a temporary image that's sitting there. I'm also going to use one for the logo so going up to the top where we had the logo and this one's going to be quite a bit smaller so I'm going to set this one as 50 by 50 and set this to have text of logo. So that adds in a logo placeholder. We have our header, we've got the navigation set up, the page content in three different sections and then a footer that's going to have three columns where we can add footer information within those columns. And there's a number of resources online so placeholder.com or lipsum.com so these are just a few of the options that you have. You can always go into Google and search for placeholder images and lorem ipsum text generators in order to get that placeholder content for your web page. So right now the web page just has the straight plain HTML and the content that's been set as placeholder content and that's in preparation for it when we start applying the styling and then we can really make some adjustments to the way the, the web content and the web page looks. So that's coming up in the next lesson. We're going to be covering how to set a responsive navigation menu. So on the smaller size screens the menu is going to stack vertically and on the larger size screens the menu is going to stack horizontally and I'll show you how to do that in this lesson. Now that we have the HTML out of the way and we've added in the images we can focus on the CSS of the web page and really bring our customizations into the web page content. So first off we did create a navigation bar so we're going to apply some styling to the navigation bar in order to first align it horizontally, get rid of the bullet within the list and also make it look more like a navigation bar. So we're going to be applying that into the navigation bar. And within the web page, we did set it up as a nav. And typically, if you are using or if you have a really big web page and you might be reusing the nav tag, you could add in a class of nav to the element in order to distinguish it. As you only want to be able to apply it to that particular element, 
You can also navigate it and make the selection under the header and any of the nav under the header can also be applied that way. So going into the style sheet and I'm gonna be selecting it under the heading tag and the nav tag under the header tag. So that's gonna select that particular element and updating it, let's set the background color of the element. And right now we'll just set it to be black. So that's gonna apply it to all of the children, including the list items. So that gives us this type of effect where it just goes black to the background. And then also for the nav, I'm gonna set the margin of the nav to be zero so that there are no margins within the nav. Within the nav, we're gonna be selecting the unordered list that's contained within the header nav. And you can also use the class that was applied, also the nav class, in order to distinguish that this is gonna be the navigation bar. So the nav is gonna be looking at this element, so this unordered list that's contained within the nav and selecting it so that it's distinct. We're gonna be removing out the list style. So using the list style property, set that to none, and that will actually get rid of the bullets. And right now we can't see it. So I'm just gonna make a quick adjustment to this and set it to white so that we can see within the display area what we're doing to update the list items. So the list style none removes out the bullets. Let's set the padding to zero also set the margin to zero. So this will get rid of any of that styling that would have been applied to the unordered list. And we're gonna be using the position in order to set the position of the elements. So using the relative position for the parent list items. And then the float left in order to float the items that are contained within there to the left. And then we're gonna to have to also be clearing the float in order to be able to select for the next elements. So let's go ahead and we're gonna do that. We're within the div, and I'm gonna give this one a class of content, or I'll give it a class of main, and then we'll select for the element that we wanna clear out and do a clear. So using the class, in order to select a class within styling, we prefix it with a dot, and then the class name. If we're selecting an ID, then we give it the hash and the ID name. So do a clear both, and that will move the following content from the float back in line to where it would have been originally. So that moved that content right back to where it originally was. I'm also gonna give this a background color so that we can distinguish it, and we can always make updates to the color afterwards. Now, going back up to the navigation bar, so that's our navigation bar there, and I'm actually gonna set that into yellow so that we can see the navigation bar and how we're adjusting it. So right now for the navigation bar, the background is set to yellow, and although we don't see any additional of the yellow for the navigation bar because we float it to the left, and that's being applied to each one of the elements. So they're just getting that default background color. So now let's select the elements and selecting the list item elements within the unordered list. So we can use this format as we were before for the selection of the list items. So that's gonna be selecting the header element with a tag of nav with an unordered list and the list items that are gonna be displayed within it. You can also shorten this and do nav unordered list list item. So depending on what the structure of your web page is going to be. So set that and set the display of these to be as inline block. And what this will do is this is going to stack these horizontally. So as soon as that gets applied, they got stacked horizontally. I'm also going to set a background color for those elements. So setting a default background color. And for this one, I'm going to set it as a dark grayish type color. And then of course we can always adjust these as needed afterwards. So that sets up the list items. And now within the nav, any of the anchor tags within the nav, and again, we can go into the header nav anchor tags and we'll display those as display block. So using the display property once again and using a display block so that will give us ability to block those elements and set the padding for the elements. And I'm gonna set the padding for it. So top and bottom is gonna be zero and left and right is gonna be 10 picks. So that gives some spacing between the elements. Let's also set the font size. 
and I'll set the font size to 1 em so that's about 16 pics and then also give it a line height so that'll allow us to center vertically the elements and setting that to about 40 pics so that gives us this type of effect where the elements are now vertically centered let's also remove out the text decoration and set that to none so there's going to be no underlines so they more look more like clickable buttons and also for the nav elements adding in a hover effect where we're going to update and change the background color of the element as it gets hovered over so set the background color and then when it gets hovered it's going to go red and then we'll update the font color to be white within the elements so now whenever we hover over them we get this type of effect and we can also apply a background color to them so we can set them to be white and then as they're not hovered over using a grayscale color we'll set it to that and make it actually a little bit darker so that gives us clickable navigation type buttons so when we resize the page the buttons are still always going to remain the same so they're not actually going to be stacking and whenever we have a smaller size screen we want the buttons to stack and we can accomplish this with the media queries so down at the bottom after we've applied the styling let's set the breakpoints for the media queries and this way we're going to be stacking the page elements and this allows us to create responsive pages so setting all of the media and and this is where we're going to have the make breakpoint for max width and set the max width to four 740 picks or whatever the desired max width is that we want to set it to and the way that this is going to work so for now we'll just set a background color for the body to be aqua so by default it's going to go aqua but whenever we resize and we've got the max width we'll set that to be black so that means that whenever it gets larger than 740 it's going to go black and whenever it's smaller than 740 it's going to go aqua so it's going to take the different properties depending on the width of the page so when we want it here we want it actually to stack and then to align horizontally if the page size is smaller instead of using the inline block we're going to use the block so selecting the elements the list items and where we set the inline block i'm going to update this to be block so that stacked it horizontally and now it's vertically whenever the page size is smaller whenever the page size adjusts it also changes the background we're going to be removing that because we don't need the background colors changing so just remove that back out of the properties and we can see that now we've got the navigation bar changing whether it's larger size pages it's horizontal and on smaller size pages it's going vertical let's set them to go all the way across across the full page and we can do that within the unordered list so going back down to where we set the list items and then because they are going to be blocked they're going to use full width and set the available width to be 100 percent so that way whenever it stacks the width is going to be 100 percent across and that gives us this type of effect for the page elements and also for the list items let's do a text align and we can center align the text so that will center those page elements whenever the page is smaller so that gives us an effect that we can use we can also update and add in to the list items so as we're stacking them we can add in a separate page element and this can just be the open menu so we just type in menu for now and that will give us a menu option that we can use when we're opening and closing the page elements so within the menu give it a class of menu so we can make a selection of that element and i'm going to set this one to go all the way across so the menu will also have a width of 100 percent it will have a background color and it'll set that background color to be black the text color set it to be white and then the display set to be block and then as the screen is smaller we won't need the menu so the menu can be set to be display none so that way it won't show whenever the page is large 
but it will show whenever we've got the drop down and that will give us an option to open and close the drop down menu buttons and we can do that with some javascript so let's also set the text aligned for this to be center and then with the javascript we can do an opening and closing of the menu content we'll set that up in the upcoming lessons how we're going to update the styling with code so now set up your navigation menu and you'll be ready to move on to the next lesson we're going to be covering how we can add in google fonts apply some fonts and also some styling to the heading area setting up the logo to float to the left and then setting large font sizes and selecting fonts from google fonts in order to bring into our web project Going over to the HTML, we do have within the head section, we had a logo and then also the header information. I'm also gonna add in another div and this one can serve as the subtext for the header or subheader for the web page. So just give it some text content there. And this adding in a class for the, I'm gonna call it heading. And then the other class is gonna be subheading. And that will give us a way to select those elements and apply some styling to it. In addition, we also have the logo within the page. So we want the logo to be on the left-hand side. So we can do a float of left on the logo. So let's go ahead and we'll select the logo. So we'll move down the rest of the content. We've got the logo as a class and set that to float left. So that will float the content to the left. I'd also want to apply to the navigation. So we've got the class of nav. We'll do a clear both for that, just as we did with main. So the class of nav is going to get the clear both applied to that element. So that will bring the navigation back in line and still allow us to float the menu over to the left-hand side. So now let's select the heading and center the heading. So doing a text align allows us to center the content and i'm also going to align the subheading so you can comma separate out if you want to apply the same style to two different elements and the heading we want to make much larger so let's set the heading and set the font size to 2em and then for the subheading we'll set the font size for the subheading to be 1.3em so that gives us two distinct headings we can even make the main heading even larger and also make the subheading slightly larger. So that gives us this type of effect. Although with the logo, it's shifting it slightly over to the left. So depending on what we want to do with the logo, we might want to just simply clear the, uh, the logo to give it its own section, or we might want to move the logo in into the heading area. So we can do that as well, where we can have within the main heading, have the logo, and then that will stack the heading and the logo, and it will keep it within the center of the content. We also want to add to the main body of the page and apply different font style to the body. And there's really good selection of fonts over at fonts.google.com. So this gives you an ability to select from over a thousand 364 different font families and bring these fonts really easily into your web projects. So there's nothing to download. You can simply link to the fonts. And this gives you an opportunity to select some really cool fonts to use within your web page. So I'm going to go ahead and select a font style and bring that into the project. So the font style, you can see the different sizes, you can see the different boldness, and then there's also italic and so on. So in order to select a style that you want to use, you can either download the family onto your system, then you'd have to upload it to the server, or you can link directly to it using the import feature. And the import feature allows you to import a font family into your project. And that's available on the right hand side. So I'm selecting the import value for importing the font, and I'm going to bring it into the style sheet so that this way it's going to be available to all of the pages that are linking to the style sheet and then selecting the font family for the body to be that newly selected font so that applies that new font across the entire web page so go back into the html and make some updates to it so that's going to be the my company name and then the subheading into the subheading and typically the subheading color 
is going to be lighter than what the heading color is. And I'm going to keep the heading color to be black and I'll make the subheading color to be slightly lighter. And then the heading color will set to be black. So that gives us an area where we've got the heading, the subheading, and we've got the navigation just below that. We can also apply when we shrink the page down. We can also update if we want to get rid of the logo or if we want to make some changes to it, we can adjust those if the page is small and if we don't have enough space within the heading area. And adding in some padding within the header and the div that's immediately within the header. So selecting the header and then the following div, adding in padding around it of 10 picks. So that will apply some additional spacing around the header. And then in addition, I'm going to add some additional padding around the header and the subheading as well. So that will space it out more, make this slightly smaller so it's closer. And I'm actually going to remove out the top and the bottom spacing and we'll have that within the main page there. So that gives us this type of effect. Uh, we can also add in some margin at the bottom. And with margin, you can select the different locations. So you can do top, left, right, and bottom, just like with padding. And that provides additional spacing between the navigation and the end of the main page area. And this can also be increased on the larger size screens. And when we go to the smaller size screens, when we don't have the amount of space that we do on the larger size screens, let's bring that down and update the size of the margin to be zero. So that way on the larger size screens and then the smaller size screens, it's more compact and we're not having as much white space around the page elements. I'm also going to reduce the size of the padding for the heading on the smaller size screens. And we'll just set that to be zero for so there's no padding on the smaller size screens. So that gives us this type of effect whenever we're resizing. You can add additional breakpoints as you needed within the different media sizes. So if you want to have in between adjustments to where the positioning is, you can do that as well. So that's how you can add in different fonts. And I'm going to set a custom font just for the heading. So something that's going to be more different than what we've got within the rest of the page content and something that will stand out a little bit more. So I'm going to select this one and going down to make a selection of the font, we can select the style, have that within the style selection under the import. We'll import both within the same import statement. And now we have an option to use within the heading, this type of style. So that's going to apply a different style to that heading and probably make the font size a little bit larger because that font is slightly small. So I'll update the font size for the heading and the subheading. So it stands out once again, even more. And you, know, you can downgrade the sizes if you want, depending on the screen size within the media queries. So you can change the font sizes there if needed. And the last part, let's go ahead and we're going to add to that header heading and the div we will set a background color for it and using a grayscale type effect. And I'm going to get rid of the background color for the divs. So that's what's causing that full to be background color of white and make this slightly lighter. So we'll set it to EEE -E -E across. So that gives us the logo, the company name, and then the subcut name for the company. So go ahead and add those into your project and you can be ready to move on to the next lesson. We're going to be applying some content structure. So for images and how we can center images, make them full width on the small screen and then have them resize to their original dimensions on the larger screen. Also how we can apply some borders, border properties to the page elements. And then selecting the page content, selecting the first letter, applying different properties and styles to those letters within the main content area. And that's all coming up in this lesson. This lesson we're going to be applying styling to the main content area. So that's the element with a class of main. There's a few articles in there and these are the different sections that we have. And I'm also going to be updating and adding these into as paragraphs. So we'll have a paragraph and then the paragraphs can also further separate out the content that we have. I'm also going to move the image slightly down within the paragraph and do the same for the other elements. So we have a bunch of paragraphs 
and then we can separate out the content even further within the paragraphs. So adding in another paragraph and splitting up the content within the paragraphs. So that gives us additional structure within the page content and allows us to do more with the selection of the page element content. So let's go back into the CSS and we'll select where we've got the main area and within main, so for images that are contained within main, we'll float those over to the left. So that will automatically align the text within the image. Uh, also adding in some padding for the image. So do a 10 pick padding so there's some spacing around the image. And depending on what we want for the image size, on the smaller size screens, sometimes you want it, might want to do an image to be full widths. So select the image and for the image, set the width to be 100%. Whereas when we've got it within the regular area, we want to set the width to be max width of 100%. So when we do do the resizing, that will allow us to make adjustments to the way the image is being displayed. And you can see there's still some overlap onto the underneath content area, so we have to make some adjustments for that. Let's go ahead and add in some additional styling where underneath the articles, we'll separate out all of the articles. So selecting the main and then article and adding in a separation. So let's add some padding to each one of the articles. Also update the font size, making the font size slightly bigger, 1.2 EM. And then adding in a border just to the bottom of the page element will give us a separator type effect for the page content. So that gives us these types of separator borders. Also the image is still overlapping and flowing across the articles. So we want to make an adjustment to that where we don't want the image to necessarily be full 100% across those. Here we can see the split between the borders a little bit better. So floating it over to the left creates quite a few challenges for us that it's going across the different sections because the image is moved right to the bottom. And this can be fixed by setting the main article for overflow. And if you set the overflow to be hidden, it will automatically push the full content within the element. So that will create that separation that we were looking for. So even when we do the resize, everything will still look proper with the overflow hidden. So adding that in makes a big difference on the way the content is being presented within the page. And then that makes the image resize properly. So on the smaller size screens, it's the full size, 100% of the image. And on the largest size screens, it's whatever the dimensions of the image are that are being displayed. Also for the image, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna add in a border of five picks. And we're gonna set the border to be white and solid. So that will give us more of a kind of a thumbnail type feel to it. And also going to remove out the padding that's around it and add a margin around it of five picks. So that will once again separate it from the rest of the content and give it more of a feel that it's kind of a thumbnail type feel to it. And we could even increase that to 10 picks. I'm also going to adjust because now that we've added in a border, we're using 100%. We want to adjust the box size styling. So I'm applying this to all of the elements. So that's the box sizing property and set it to border box. And what this will do is this will force it back into the 100% width. Notice that the image is still not properly aligned. So the border box and the box sizing will fix the border and the padding. So if we do have border and padding, it will keep it remained as centered, but the margin is still throwing it off. So we need to change the margin to match with what we're doing for the max width. And we're gonna set that at 2%. And then the max width is gonna be set at 96%. So that will give us a total of 100% and allowing us to center the content. And let's try it on the larger size screens and then also on the smaller size screens. So once we're happy with the combination of padding, border and margin and width, then we can move on to the rest of the content. And the rest of the content, there's not a whole lot more to do for the styling. We've added in the section breaks and also the font. If we want to, we can separate out and we can select the first letter of the paragraph if we want to bold that. 
So that's an interesting effect. So selecting underneath the article, any of the paragraphs, and then selecting the first letter of the paragraph. And we can make a, change the font size if we want. So send that to 2EM. Just gonna make those larger. So those are some of the effects that you can do. You can also set the color. So if you want to use a red color for those to make those stand out. You go ahead and make updates as needed to the content area. And coming up next, we're gonna look at the bottom columns and make updates to those on the styling. And also make sure you do the resizing to ensure that the web page is behaving as expected. And you can be ready to move on to the next lesson. So this is we're gonna be wrapping up the project and the updates to the footer, making a three column footer. So it's gonna stack on the smaller screens. We're gonna have the three columns on the larger screens. The text is gonna be centered, making some adjustments to the bullet points and also some of the padding to those page elements. And that's gonna be covered in this lesson where we're covering the footer. Go down to the footer area and within the styling, we're gonna make a selection of the footer. So we already have a footer, but let's add in a class in order to separate out in case we wanna use the footer tag again. And then we've got a number of columns within the footer. So give these ones a class as well. If we wanna be able to distinguish them and have separate styling applied to each one, we're gonna have different footer columns. So we can have first, second, and third. So now we can select them within the styling. We're gonna get rid of the background color that we have update this to the class for footer. And let's set the height of this footer. And we're gonna set it to be 200 picks. So that will give us more height for the footer content. And then within the, each one of the elements, so within the footer, so we've got the first column. We're gonna set that to be a, have a width. And if we wanted to have different widths, so we can set one to be 25 and also let's comma separate out and we'll also add this to the third and then to the second column set the width to be 50 picks so that will make the center column twice as wide as the first columns i'm also going to add in and select these elements so all of the divs that are immediately underneath the footer so select the divs and set those over to float. And we'll float them left. So we'll use the floats in order to float the different columns. We're also gonna set the text align to center align the text. So that will center align the different columns. And I'll add in a border around them so that we can distinguish between the three columns that we have. And in order to fix the clear style we don't have another element that's going to be afterwards so what you can do is you can select the footer and use after in order to set the content that's going to come afterwards and add that in with styling so just some blank content and set the display to be table display and then there we can add in the clear both so we can clear out any of the additional styling for those columns. So now we're ready to add in content into the columns. So within the footer as well, let's uh, go ahead and we'll add in some padding. So add some padding around them so to move those elements down from the top. And let's update some of the content here. So you might have an address within this area and separating out the address so we can do it as a paragraph. So give it an address for the first one and then the last one can maybe we want to set this up to be a contact area. So contact and then you can add in some social media links there. So having a link one, two, and three. So that can be used as placeholders. And let's set these up as top links. And maybe we want to have an unordered list and list item. And then just do some updates to the content. So that will give us this type of effect. 
Uh, I'm also going to be updating the links of so the bullet points. So let's make some updates to those. As right now it's really spread out because the text is aligned to center. So we'll update the second and we'll do a text align. So set the text align to left align. So the bullet points are closer together. You can text align that. And maybe for this one as well, let's add in a little bit more padding. And scroll down. So that gives us uh, these, this type of effect for the bottom border and on the larger size screens. And then of course on the smaller size screens. We can also set the content here within the second. Uh, let's add in a div and I'll give it a class and the class will just be column. So this one we can set as the element and we can center this content. So that gives us a way to center the content so we can remove out the padding and select the element and do a margin of zero or automatic. So it will automatically center it. And then we'll set a width of this to be 80%. So that gives us a way to better center the content that we have within the content area. And maybe also what we want to do here is we want to maybe stack them on the smaller size screens. So we can select the elements and on the smaller size screens, we're going to go 100% across. So that will give us the stacking of the elements. And for this one, we'll center align the text. And then we'll also remove out the bullet points because when you center align the text, that doesn't look right. So selecting the list items and then we can set the list style. That will remove out the list style on the smaller size screens and on the larger size screens, it's gonna still go back to the default of the list and it's also gonna align it to the left. So depending on how you wanna display it, you can make some adjustments as needed to those. So for the footer itself, and usually they, you find that they're gonna be darker. So I'm gonna set, set it to be black and we'll set the font color to be white. So that gives us this type of effect and notice we're still not able to see the list items there. So let's uh, see what happened here where we're not getting the full background color. And that's because we've got the height there. Uh, so let's remove out height for the footer. And so this gives us the footer for the page. We've got the header there with the logo and it's fully resizing. So you can make adjustments as needed to the page content and the styling that we've covered in the previous lessons. So this lesson we're going to be using some JavaScript and applying JavaScript, which is going to give us the ability and the user the ability to select and open and close the navigation bar on the smaller size screens. On the bigger size screens, we're always going to be able to see the navigation bar. On the smaller size screens, we've got a menu button that we can click to open and close it. So toggling the ability to see the navigation or to not see it. And this is an option that you can add into the website using some JavaScript code. This lesson we're going to be applying JavaScript in order to make our navigation bar more functional so that we can open and close our navigation menu when it's opened. So let's go ahead and we're going to select and create within the HTML, adding in JavaScript. I've created a file called app.js and this is where our JavaScript will go. So within the HTML, I want to link to the JavaScript file and this is just apply the functionality. So the source for the JavaScript is going to be app.js and then close off the script tag with the attribute source linking to the JS file. So the first thing that we want to do is select the page element that we want to use. And the page element that we want to use is going to be within the menu. So it's got a class of menu. So just as we did with styling, we can select that page element. So we're going to assign it to a variable called main and then using the document object and the query selector method, we're selecting the element with a class of main. So the classes, just like with CSS, are indicated with the class of main. So we prefix it with a period and then the class name. I'm going to use the console log in order to output the main element that we've just selected. Let's go ahead and we're going to open up the console within the console tab. And there's our selected element of main. So we want to be able to have that clickable that's going to open and shut 
the main navigation menu. So we want to be hiding the navigation menu, but we also want it whenever the page resizes that that navigation menu can open back up. So if the real if the full size is available, we want to always have that visible. So we want to apply to that element the style property of hidden whenever the menu gets clicked. So we're going to toggle that hidden option, that hidden class on the menu. So going into the navigation itself, going into the CSS, we're going to create a class called hide menu. And this will be a display none on the hide menu. And the default for this on the smaller size screen will be display none. And on the larger size screen, it will be display block. And we're going to be applying that hide menu class to the HTML element for the menu. So within the menu itself, within the navigation, we're going to apply the hide menu option. So on the smaller size screens, by default, it's hidden. On the larger size screens, we still see our navigation menu. And we want to be able to toggle hide menu on the nav class. And we're going to make the menu clickable. So selecting the element by its class. And I'll update this to be menu, so it makes more sense. And then menu, and then output the menu. And we can add an event listener. So we can add a click event to the menu. And on the other side of this event, it's going to be expecting a function. And you can also use the arrow format, or you could use the keyword function in order to create the function. So whenever it gets clicked, right now within the console, we're just going to write the word click so that we know that we've been able to con click and connect to the menu. And as we click it, so we're clicking and we're seeing that being registered as an event for the menu. And what we want to do is we want to toggle the hide menu on the unordered list. So we want to hide it and we want to display it and we also want to remove it. So let's add in a, another class. And this one will just be hide. And within the styling, display. So we have an element that we can remove and add in on the hide menu element. So select the hide menu. And you can just call it hide menu as well. And selecting the element that has a hide menu. And then using the class list, we're going to toggle the class of hide. So that's toggling it on and off. And I'll update the properties for hide. So we're using the hide menu in order to select it and the hide class in order to hide it. So now when we toggle the menu, it's toggling the hide class. And when we expand it, we're always able to see the menu. So let's go ahead and we're going to hide the menu. And then we still see our navigation. Make sure that we're able to see the navigation when we expand out and only when we click the menu that we're toggling the menu. Also, let's make the menu slightly bigger because it's a little bit hard to see. So select the menu element and add in some padding around it. So that will make it a little bit easier to see, make it more clickable. And also whenever we're hovering over it, let's change the background color. So set it to blue and try it out. Make sure that we're able to select it to toggle the menu to open and close it. And then when the menu is closed, open up to full size and make sure you can still see the navigation menu. And that's the effect that we're going for. So it's a really simple bit of JavaScript code where we can select the element. And you can also simplify this where we don't necessarily need to use the query selector. And we can do this within just the one statement where we could remove out this and just have the query selector directly on the page element and that's still going to work the same way. And also we can get rid of the console log where we've just got the on click and then we've got the document where we're toggling the class list of hide on the element. And that will just remember wherever it was set last. So if it's open, when it closes, it's going to remain open. And when it's closed on the expansion, it's going to start out and remain closed. When we refresh the page, by default, it will be closed. You can also set it to be by default to be open. So you can remove out the hide and that will default to be open. And the toggling will still work where we're toggling it to close and open as we're expanding with the JavaScript code. 
So this is an option that you can add some interaction and that the users can open and close the menu on the small size screens. Go ahead and add it into your project if this is the effect that you want.